During one of my hospital stays that overlapped with the social media era, Scotty Deep Geek Fitzgerald did something that almost none of my fans or acquaintances would do. He came to visit me in the hospital, even though we didn't really know each other beyond online. It's a surreal but touching moment to have somebody come into your hospital room where you're bored and somewhat anxious and say that they only know you from things that you've written and stuff that you've worked on, but they wanted to show a personal touch and support and letting you know that they were wishing you well and hoping that you got better. I was extraordinarily touched by this, and I've thought about it often. But anyway, Scotty wrote in to suggest an episode about advanced audio formats. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It, a podcast about technology, history, and getting myself out of debt. Thanks to Peter Healy, Daniel Boyd, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. I have very little direct knowledge around the specific advances in audio file formats. And it's a plague of podcasts that people will say that they don't know anything specific about something and then fill 15 minutes of your life with their random thoughts on it. But while I couldn't recount to you all of the different proposed audio formats or the different moments in time and which ones came and went and which ones were adopted and why, I do have quite a bit of experience talking about the generalized digital file format world, and maybe there's something to learn from there. We are living in interesting times, to be sure, but we are also privileged to be living at a time when decades of research and efforts to make collaborative information spaces have advanced to the point of near instantaneous process. I can set up a Google Doc with my first thoughts in some direction, get a few energetic volunteers to help me, and then, literally, within a few hours, we'll have a document that would have taken somebody in the 30s or 40s or 50s hundreds of people and months of work to attain. Being able to copy and paste from a whole variety of sources or being able to write and see in real time what others are writing, that's an amazing thing to sit before us. The fact that most people don't take advantage of it or that it's not on everybody's top priority right now is totally understandable. But as somebody who's been working and setting off projects for years, there's been nothing more elating to know that we can see our minds working in real time towards a goal. Combine this with the fact that the Internet Archive is getting north of 7,000 new unsolicited documents a day, and many of them have never been seen before outside of a specific file folder or buried in some obscure site, and you see that we have at our fingertips the ability to combine these two bonanzas into research projects that would have never happened before. Maybe it's my age, but I'm spending a lot less time furtively running up the side of a mountain thinking that I'll just scale it, and maybe spending more and more of my time turning around to see how far we have climbed and to appreciate the breathtaking view we've been given. Introspection has not traditionally been something that technology has afforded us. It's always been about getting ahead, proposing new ideas, and then laying them down wherever you can. With the combination of endless amounts of magazines, brochures, journals, academic papers, even archived blog entries, we can now look back 
do full text searches on concepts and unique phrases that bring things to light and be able to create reports on them. One of my private joys of the last year has been conducting all sorts of exercises with Lane Nooney, who is an NYU academic who asks very hard questions, questions that I am surprised take as long to find out, and often not as definitively as I would have liked. Allow me to give you an example. One of the calcified legends of vintage computing is the story of Steve Wozniak, Steve Jobs, and Atari Breakout. In this legend, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak worked on an advancement to Atari Breakout, where it was taking up a certain amount of integrated circuits, and Nolan Bushnell offered a bounty for how many integrated circuits or ICs it could be reduced down to. As the legend goes, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs worked together, were able to optimize it down to an incredibly small number, and then presented it to Atari for the bounty. But the legend turns dark, because while Steve Jobs was given $5,000 to do this work, Steve Wozniak was only paid half of $800, which is what Steve Jobs told him the bounty was. Now, that's the highest level of the legend, that Steve Jobs screwed over Steve Wozniak. If you read it in some locations, you will find out that Steve Wozniak, found out years later, cried but forgave Jobs for whatever happened. But Lane asked a very simple question, which actually turned out to be very hard, which was, how do we know this is the case? Certainly Steve Wozniak mentioned here and there about it. But where exactly did it all come from? And utilizing collections of text at the archive, both in books and in magazines, and pulling it back farther and farther, here's some of what we found out. First of all, any source after 1990 is pretty much useless. It's just people repeating stories that other people have repeated and so on. Seeing postings from Atari engineers who were around at the time, they discussed the actual technical issues regarding the breakout board that Wozniak designed, that because of the wire wrapping and the techniques, it was just a little bit too hard for Atari manufacturing to work with, and so it never got used, and a different optimized design became the final breakout design. It's acknowledged that Wozniak's design was superior if you only counted ICs, but it wasn't superior in terms of reproducibility under the way that Atari manufactured things. The payment of $800 seems accurate at the time, but a book comes out in the early 1980s about Atari up to that point, and in there is a mention of the breakout story and the number of $5,000 pops up and says that Nolan Bushnell paid that to Jobs. While reading that Atari book, Andy Hertzfeld, who had worked on the Macintosh and HyperCard, told Wozniak to go find the book and read it and find that passage. And it was on an airplane that Steve Wozniak read that chapter and cried on the way to his destination. And that's it. That is the full germ of what's available out there. A book that, frankly, was okay and based off of some oral remembrances of Atari, threw out that number, supposedly from Bushnell, as an aside, and from there, Hertzfeld made the connection that this applied to the Jobs Wozniak bounty and then told Wozniak. We don't have any other citations. Everything that came out afterwards came from that book and all of the implications of what happened and all the actuality of what happens never comes out of Jobs or anybody else involved. So we don't, in fact, know what actually happened. 
It was a story repeated to another story, and then the idea of betrayal of your friend adds to the job's legacy and myth, and here we are today. And all of this came around because Lane asked the question. That, to me, indicates how much the road extends in front of us and how much farther we have to go. Throughout the history of technological advancement, we see examples all the time of what I call the game of firsts, the game where people claim that they were the first to do something this way, and just a number of circumstances and unluckiness led to it not being the dominant way we do things now. For every time you see a format become the prominent one, whether it's WAVE or ZIP or JPEG, there are dozens, maybe hundreds, of alternative formats that are proposed, fall apart in committee, or get implemented in only one or two places, never to be picked up again. You have cases where somebody says, what is the maximum that technology can derive? And then from there, try to create something that is portable, that is convenient, that can be implemented with the least amount of pain using current equipment. If you have the kind of steel neck that can stop your head from nodding off, I recommend looking into the history of television transmission, the choices made for scan lines, electrical equipment, and broadcast that resulted in not the best image, not the best sound, but what technology could implement as cheaply as possible. The years between high-definition television and its final inclusion are way more than you would expect. The prototypes that we've had over the years that have been long ago forgotten and then implemented at a cost of a few dozen dollars where once they would have cost tens of thousands of dollars happen over and over and over again. File formats are not implemented based on justice. They're implemented based on a whole range of factors, economic, political, and opportunistic, that we forget about looking back. Many times I've read a proposal document for a format or a way of doing things with technology, even social action, that require such an upheaval of the current status quo that it's one of those factors that's going to stop it, not its own inherent worth. So in terms of audio, there have been endless numbers of formats and media proposed to make them long-lasting, portable, or manipulatable, producing what we would think of as the finest fidelity available, and its other factors that led to their demise. It doesn't matter if you come up with an audio format that records things at twice the bandwidth of your current technology, if it's not easy to spin up a factory to hit those numbers consistently. If you produce a piece of audio equipment that will cost five or six times what a current technology is, and it's not demonstrably five times better, you're kind of doomed. You might be able to get your hands on a few investors and produce some prototypes or some very, very specific one-of-a-kind demonstrations, but you're not going to hit those numbers with a consumer level that any organization is going to buy into. Lying in file cabinets and in the back of archives are proposals for all sorts of improvements to our sound and audio landscape that just unfortunately are doomed to ever become something we're going to use anytime soon. And there might be a mistake made when you find them to think that these were some advanced obsolescence-proof versions that people were conspiring to keep hidden. I don't think that's the case. Yes, it would be entirely possible to create radio and broadcast versions of sound that would dominate and destroy a flack. You would also require an amount of the radio broadcast bandwidth that would end 
radio stations in your area. It's all about the balance. It's all about knowing all these factors at once. Needless to say, I'm a huge advocate of saving all these proposals, of keeping them around, making them searchable, making them able to answer questions that people like Lane might ask in the future. When did we first think this was a good idea? Why didn't we do it? What were people's responses? Finding everything from commentary to overviews to prototype reports makes us more informed in the present day to ask questions that we wouldn't be able to answer 5 or 10 or 15 years ago. As somebody who is dedicated to appreciating the present, I can only tell you that we are in in its very own way, a platinum age of information retrieval. The Internet, generally, is working. The Internet Archive is humming away. A whole range of people who were, if not part of the story, very well informed about it, are just an email, a Discord, a Slack, a Twitter away. We can ask questions and get answers. We don't pick among the bones of the dead and wish we knew what they had to say. We have an opportunity here that we should be taking, both as amateur and professional historians, both as collectors of random information and inquisitors about what came before us, to have this wonderful world provide us insight and understanding that will feed us for the information and knowledge that we are endlessly hungry for. The world needs more people like Lane turning around and asking if what we think of as indisputable legends aren't just little games of telephone passed from shaky source to conversation and giving us a not just fuzzy but malformed vision of what came before. Because like the debate of audiophiles as to what sounds best and what has the most fidelity and reproduction, our ability to discern what was of the past and what lessons it can teach us and just myth and stories that we are using to drive our intentions in the present is going to continue to be our most vital and important task. This is Jason Scott Talks His Way Out of It. Thanks to James Bekoyanu, Emilio Oliveira, Mark Pilgrim, Scott Roseanne, Scott McGrady, Wayne Arthurton, and the hundreds of other supporters on Patreon and elsewhere who have been supporting me and helping me get out of debt. Maybe I'm just sentimental, but there's something so deeply emotional for me about going to a document written in the 18th, 19th, or 20th century that I have found on the Internet Archive or elsewhere, and reading words written for a world that doesn't exist anymore, and with me so happily lifted on the wings of modern technology, and taking for a moment a time away from conflict, disagreement, and argument, and just appreciating that somebody whose job was to inform and entertain, is living again in my heart and my thoughts today. What a sparkling, brilliant gift. <laughs>